Hello, everybody. Um, thank you so much for having me. Um, this is the live book trailer for Bright Shards of Someplace Else. And basically what we did is we wanted to play around with the idea of using different voices to kind of give it a, a sense of what the book's going to be about. So what you're going to see tonight is a blend of scenes that were written specifically for tonight's event. Some of the scenes are kind of expanded versions of scenes that are in the stories. Some are scenes before the story began. Um, and also we're going to do some readings from the book. So you're going to get kind of a blend. Um, we're going to do five different pieces um, today. And I want to introduce my actors and collaborators because the other thing about this whole process is when we came up with these scenes, we used improv acting as part of what helped us choose what scenes to do. So um, Jason Faust, uh, Natalie Bird, and Christopher Stevens will be acting, and they also helped um, with the writing of this. So the first piece, there's going to be um, five total. The first piece is improvisation, and it's going to be a blend of reading and a little bit of acting. The play was a success and all the actors crowded into the green room, gasping and talking loudly, still projecting as if on stage, their individual voices flung over each other like grappling hooks thrown to opposite ledges. The success was made all the sweeter by all the ways it was nearly not. Rosie, the lead, is grinning and crying with relief and exultation, and a long eyeliner drip changes course as she throws her head back to laugh. The knocking was supposed to happen after Gracie tells me about what happened to the baby. But I start hearing the knocking before she gets, even gets a line out. So get this, I start stomping on the floor to cover up the sound of the knocks. And I explain it by saying I'm trying to confuse the termites. And Gracie says, The rest is lost as all attention moves to John, who is red-faced and sweating, squatting and gesturing at an invisible object that he marks out with two forefingers in the air. I was supposed to pick up a vase on the sideboard and explain how fragile it is, you know, like a damn metaphor. And, and while I get going on my spiel and walk over to the sideboard and no vase, no nothing. So, I'm stuck explaining how fragile the damn sideboard is. And let me tell you, that thing doesn't look too fragile. <laughs> Two actors argue loudly enough to turn heads. In their scene, a wall of the set came down and they had to jump aside. Gled had continued with his lines as if nothing had happened. The other, Hale, had exclaimed about the shoddy-ass slumlord Ron Pitt. That is, he responded by responding in character. Glenn has a glass of wine in his hands and shakes it to make a point. Responding to the falling to the set at all takes the audience out of the moment. It acknowledges the art of this. Hal is bent over the party tray, and sweat shakes off his mustache at every word. It looks worse to ignore it. They continue to argue as everyone leaves the green room and walks the light slick streets to the after party, where there are more flushed faces and rousing stories of all the, play, all the ways the play was saved. The mishaps taken in nonplus stride, the, long, the wrong lighting cues, the lost props, the badly timed entries, the stage frightened, the missed lines, and the too soon departs. A thin young man, Jack, with a congr congratulatory rose stamped off in his buttonhole, laughs and tells his stories, listens to the others, and leaves finally for home with the sense of loss that always follows even a good show. But I must insist, Cecil. As he walks, he begins reciting lines from the play, of which he has precious few as the nephew of the patriarch, who is written in late only to move the plot along. But the Duke was just here. I thought I saw the mistress in the garden that very night. This was left on the Davenport. He repeats all his lines over and over, like a miser wrist deep in a pile of coins, pulling them up to hear them drop. The street is mostly dark, and the street lights go out one by one. In fact, they go out as he approaches. He keeps on. There is a place he often goes for drinks, but when he gets there, it is no longer a decades-old neighborhood bar, but an ice cream parlor. He shrugs and gets a late-night cone. He walks and walks too far. The night wind whips the stem of his rose back and forth so fast it becomes a blurred arc, like a hummingbird treading air. He is lost. He looks around and sees his neighborhood rising above in the background as if it's a city in the sky resting on the rooftops of the neighborhood he's in. He can just see the molding around the top window of his apartment, the highest frond of his rubber plant. But there seems to be no way through. He darts back and forth across the street, his path like a stitch drawing the two curbs closed. 
Suddenly, he is flying through the air, not towards his apartment in the sky, but away from it. He sees the stars between his toes. It is like the trick with the wires when Grace, as the angel, is sent to tell the Duke a message from his dead mother. A horribly trite moment, but the way the angel swings and pinwheels from her waist is almost worth it. Tonight, her harness slid down to her upper leg, changing her pivot point so that she somersaulted completely backward and had to deliver her lines at the Duke's feet through gossamer and netting, while her naked legs pedaled above. Still, she maintained her prophetic sweetness. He makes contact and crumples like a time-lapsed closing rose. The stars he sees now are interwoven into one cyclopic light, the kind that keeps you from seeing the audience. The blood in his eyes becomes a smoke screen behind which the scene is switched. The curtain is hit from the inside and buckles out in momentary ripples. A thin shelf of light project, projects outward between the fringe and the floor. The big dark shapes lurch and scrape. He must respond. Continuity was the name of the game. If you ever pause too long on stage, if you were ever thrown, he thinks of the messenger who stood at the door to the Duke's place, parcel in hand, with the slight obligation of saying, a package for you, Duke. But who froze under the pressure nonetheless. His silence, the vicarious shame of the whole room, the poised moment that went on and on, wobbling and circling its conclusion while no one took a breath. His soul is working itself free of his body, like an actress snaking her way out of a tight, long dress with two stagehands pulling on the hem. With a great and violent undulation, he is almost out, but in a heroic moment, his body sits bolt upright and grabs the soul by the wisp of its trailing end, pulling it down, and he cups it in his hand with a beautific, civic-minded civic smile, like this is the opening of a public affair and he is in the possession of the dove to be symbolically released. He lets go like he means to do it. In the empty, empty orchestra pit, the void pads in and picks up the toothpicks and gum wrappers, music stands, and whatever else, then hangs there, like a custodian getting some shut-eye propped on two folding chairs. Even the celestial choir begins with coughs and laughs and people losing their place. So now, our next piece is based on the story um, Ornament and Crime. So we're going to have a scene followed by that story delivered as a monologue. And these two are at an urn shop, and there are many urns. What I like to tell the clients is just to come in and go to the first vessel that inspires you. Think of your father and let his spirit guide you to the right choice. Oh, wow. There are a lot of choices. Yes, we are very proud of our showroom. <clears throat> Sometimes music helps. I can cue up your father's favorite tune, if you'd like. Do you have John Cage's four minutes and 33 seconds? I can check. No, don't bother. Uh, the ambient sound is, is good. Now, I see you eyeing our Verilux collection. That is a popular choice. The scroll work and the lovely vine and grape motif is designed by a local artisan. And it can be etched in fine calligraphy with a message of your choosing. No, that won't work. All the flowers and the extra stuff, no. I see. Uh, let me direct you to this Athens works piece, a muscular white column to symbolize your father's strength. They all seem so three-dimensional. They're all like jutting out. Is there anything, I don't know, flatter? I'm afraid they have to be three-dimensional to accommodate the, the cremains. Maybe this would help your selection process. This is our themed section for the hobbyist. We have gone fishing, and this lovely gilded putter form for the golfer. Any of these connecting with you and your father's spirit? No. Okay, so not a golfer. <laughs> what were his hobbies? Uh, fires. He liked fires, setting them. Ah, a camper. <laughs> this vessel is reminiscent of a beautiful multi-ringed stump, each ring representing a year in the outdoorsman's life. No. That won't work. Too irregular. Way too irregular. Or this one? 
A beautiful antler form with a camouflage base to honor the quiet moments in the deer blind. He hated any kind of uneven transitions between colors. Isn't there something simpler? These are all so busy. I realize this is an emotional decision. Every child wants to get it right. Let me show you our elemental collection. We mine this lovely collection from nature. We have beautiful rose quartz, black onyx, mm -hmm. opal. Some say these stones have a healing energy. No, they won't work. He needs something plain, a form that performs its function and no more. Look at the opal again. It's simple and pure. Like your father's spirit, I'm sure. The man was an arsonist. He burned everything he found ugly, which would include this place, I think. I beg your pardon? That would have been a fine headline. Crematorium reduced to ashes. <laughs> I understand. Grief can make us feel unbalanced, but <laughs> let me show you the opal vessel. It can be etched with a personal message. This might work. Checks off the boxes. Geometric. Form follows function. Stainless steel was one of his few acceptable materials. Excuse me. Uh, we use that one for our John Doe's. That's not really part of our retail line. Um, I need to see if it's a level. Really? Those are only used when we can't locate any next of kin. I can't do this with my naked eye. Do you have a level? I have one on my phone. This will do. I'll take it. Sometimes, unresolved feelings can cause us to make decisions that we later regret. My hope is that you don't pick this and say, I should have picked the onyx. <laughs> my father has died, uh, and in my hand are his remains. Ash is pressed into a small, flattish cube, and I'm laboring to insert him into something so that he sits flush. He always wished to be a geometric form, so often did he rail against the tyranny of the organic, that I could tell myself he'd be happy. But he also hated bric-a-brac, and I think right now he'd qualify, being a small object with no function. Better to join him with a nice, flat plane. Shin up a gap on a sleek, modernist home. There are plenty around here. Some are monolithic and shimmering, with metal roofs that sweep across the facades, the entrance is coyly obscured. Others are crouched tightly to their lawns, their recessed windows narrowed and aglow. I walk through the backyards, pretending to be a meter reader. I'm wearing Dad's red jumpsuit, the one he wore in prison, and a tool belt to complete the look. I stop and study each house. I pull out the cube and run it along the siding, storm windows, blocks, etc., hoping to feel it dip into place. It does in the back deck of a glass monolith, a house that resembles a drive-in movie screen upon which a scene of a Weimariner darting between two mid-century daybeds repetitively plays. I almost leave him, but the cube looks too obvious in the space between boards. Before he set our neighbor's dollhouse shed on fire using a plain silver zippo, triumph of utilitarian design, and naphtha, we lived together in a Danish modern home. What I recall most was cleaning the stainless steel refrigerator, chasing a smudge of grease round and round, driving it across the surface with a Windex rag, only to have it reappear on the other side. So teasing and full of character. Seemed like a friend. Then Dad went to jail. For him, prison was a revelation. He thrilled at the cells with their efficient layouts, the clean-lined cinder block walls, the low toilets, the austere bunks, the iconic red princess phones, heavy with engineering. The plexiglass, turned nicely matched from all the scratches. The pleasingly unadorned speech of the prisoners. The afternoon light quivers on the horizon edge of an infinity pool. Blocky red sheds sit in this backyard near cast concrete stools made to look like tree stumps. I consider dropping him in the pool, it is a nice pool, and saying my goodbye in a swirl of deep end bubbles. A safe place for a dead arsonist. I'm holding him up to the sun, ready to let go, when a shadow crowds my peripheral. It's a man, dressed in a beige polo, rounding the corner. I step behind a streaky pot of grass. The man is carrying a rake. 
with superfluous flourish, like someone signing an important document with a triumphant lift of the pen, he makes a small pile of silver leaves. Paid by the hour, my dad would say, not by the job. I remember dad running his hands over surfaces. Our granite countertop had pink striations, like veins. When it was clean, which was often, he would run his palm quickly over the whole edge and off the edge. Then he would hold his arm out, trying to keep it at the same level for a second. If there were things on the counter, junk mail, mother's shed bracelets, restaurant mints, they were swept off in this way. My mother used to stop his hand by putting hers down on and pressing. For a few moments, he moved both their hands along very slowly before his fingers lifted up under the weight, like those overloaded donkey carts you sometimes see on dusty streets held aloft by their burdens. While on probation, he tried burning down a house with busy stained glass windows. The windows depicted a lush jungle scene, and the interior of the house was buried under zebra print, fake palm fronds, and red velvet couches. The owner was the retired principal of my high school. After he left the school, he wore a fresh kimono every day and walked five small exotic dogs on a complex, twisted leash. So it seemed the dogs were leading one another while the line to my old principal was slack. During one of these walks, my dad set the old man's garbage on fire, hoping it would ignite the house, but it only melted the bin partway and made the neighborhood stink. That's what ugly smells like. He said, paging through an interior design magazine as two policemen clomped up the stairs, joking with each other so boisterously that when I opened the door, false solemnity snatched over their faces like sheets yanked over caught lovers. They hid their snickers with coughing fits as they walked Dad out. For a few days, the house was a peaceful place. Without his expensive connoisseurship, the tyranny of taste, I could experience the toaster, switch plates, and spoons without a thought to the missteps or glories of their forms. Mother and I ate off the old flour china and didn't bother to nicely plate the meal, monogramming it with sauce. You have the worst problem. No taste. Worse than even bad taste, since bad taste requires at least Point of view. The cube is warm in my hand, and I keep sort of tossing it in front of me as I walk. Never been a good catch, but I'm catching it fluidly each time. A few people, nannies mostly, rattle by with strollers and kids squeal as they spot my game. When I was young, after my father left, my mother dressed me bizarrely for quite some time. For instance, she sometimes had me wear different plaids from head to toe, or found several zippered pieces, pants, shirt, boots, and put them all on me at once. It seemed to be a problem for everyone else but me. Even school kids with a reputation for cruelty felt compelled to give me gentle tutorials on what looked right, speaking with strong authority about what buttons to leave unbuttoned and the like. When I told mother this, she grabbed my face, looked me in the eye, unsettling intensity, and told me never to forget the freedom that was ugliness. My girlfriend Yolanda picks me up by the gate in the development. I lean over to hug her and she feels the sharp angles of the cube in my palm. She wants to know why I still have the cube. Wasn't I supposed to finally say my goodbyes? Yolanda is dressed like always, a skirt and a shirt, big jewelry, and her purse, fat like a bladder, quivers by the shifter. It's made of soft, crinkled leather and resembles, in its general aspect, those old-fashioned cold compresses for headaches. A leather tassel hangs off the side. There's something obscene in the way the purse rests between us. Plops, really. Opulent, heavy-bellied, and insolent, like some coddled prince of a foreign land. The gray-brown color, a versatile neutral, Yolanda said, is so much like the gelatinous skein of fat at the margins of cheap meat cuts. It is terrible. The windows are down and the air rushes around us. I hold the cube of my father in one hand. In a sudden motion, I grab the purse with the other and hurl it from the moving car. Yolanda howls. The brakes engage and the car skids to a stop. Yolanda jumps out. I look around, praying. This was a fluke. I see the clean line road, the nasty brackish ditch water where the purse sinks, the lovely tree canopy, the overstuffed lumps of cumulus clouds, the, the world, world cleaves into beautiful and ugly things. It is, it is just, just as bad as seeing double or hallucinating. I watch as Yolanda pulls the purse out of the ditch gingerly, backing up with it like a collie pulling a drowned toddler from a river. 
She slips and curses up at me. <laughs> For years, Mother darkly intimated that I would end up like Dad. She's in Florida now, amongst her ceramic cow figurines, crocheting garish beach totes, hideous objects meant to ward off any tastemaker retirees who might spirit her away. Just a blip, I say to myself. But then I look up and see the shabby, chic glamour of my Yolanda, her skin through the mud like peeling strips of Victorian wallpaper, freckled buds among cream, and I tighten my hold on the cube. Okay, our next piece um, is from Key Phrases. Jason will be reading part of the story and then we will go into a scene. I had to fire them all. Today was the day. The regional director had called me and told me apologetically that they had received enough complaints about them all over the last six months to necessitate it and that the previous person in my position had issued her several warnings, none of which had made any difference. I'm sorry you have to be the one to do it so early in your employment, he said, but at least you don't know her too well yet. That should make it easier. He was right. I did not know Maul at all. She was simply an unkempt and increasingly occasional presence in the office next door. I'd been working for Journeys and Memorials for only two months when I heard from the director. Our company made videos of deceased loved ones to play at funerals or wakes, but I was assured during my interview that the workplace was nonetheless youthful and upbeat. To demonstrate, I was invited to a family fun picnic by the upper management the first weekend after I started. I had been to enough company fun days in my working life to know this could be a cheerful drunken group vent or a snake pit of office politics where every catch of pass represented a subversive uprising or an affirmation of an inexorable power dynamic. But the panic was instead a desperate counterbalance to what I would discover was as morose a workplace as it sounded. The paper plates were cut to resemble gravestones, and different managers roasted each other by delivering mock eulogies, the speaker with the beer in hand and the roastee standing on a picnic table, a bedraggled funeral wreath about his neck. During this display of forced gallows humor and impenetrable inside jokes... Paint the dog, Georgie! Paint it! A youngish woman, laughing and splotched face, stopped to say hello. Isn't this a riot? She said. The woman began glossing the jokes and references. You see, George once dumped a live dove in a bucket of food dye since he needed a clip of a cardinal flying. <laughs> she asked me where I was from, downstate, if my family liked it here. I lived alone. And then she asked how that was working out. When I told her living alone was fine, my preference, really, I flattened my slightly eastern dialect to that of a bland midwestern mid-century broadcaster. That was my first and longest interaction with Maul, before I was told to fire her. I was hoping to leave a message on her voicemail rather than having to do it in person, but Maul had inexplicably shown up at work, dressed sharply, and full of heretofore unseen passion and competence for the job. All day I heard her answering and making calls in a crisp and comforting tone, a must in the business of memorial videography. All of us were supposed to list, use a list of euphemisms for death, funerals, and the bereaved, but a few of the workers I oversaw bothered. Yet, all day, I could hear Maul using the key phrases. Memorial gatherings. And. Remembrance festivals. And. Celebrators. I, I even heard her refer to funeral goers as. Loving reminiscers. Her own inspired <laughs> creation. But Maul was terribly unreliable and had seemed in the few exchanges I had had with her to not even register what she was doing wrong. Maul was clearly a clueless woman, but from what I understood, she needed the job and expected to keep it. It fell to me to revise this belief. Like anyone, I stalled. I found work that I convinced myself was more pressing. I watered all the plants in the office. To head it all the dead flowers, shuffled papers, then steeled myself to do it. I found her in the video room that afternoon, screening her own work. 
It was the first time I'd seen her there in weeks. Well, what do you think? It's pretty neat what I did with the, with the ending. What huh? did you do? It just looked like a grainy sky or something. And that music, what, what was that dance music? It, it sounded like club music. Trance music. It's called trance music. But anyway, didn't you see the rainbow trout in the sky? It's the kind of fish Halson loved. See how it becomes a rainbow at the end? A double rainbow over the river. That was a rainbow? And, and a fish? I just saw some streaks. I'll just go in there and sharpen the contrast. Well, I don't think... Isn't that great what I do with the red sunset and the river? The river looks bloody. You know the guy drowned, right? How am I supposed to know that? It's in the file. You're supposed to look over. Oh. I just read the first section about the fishing thing. Did you see what I did with that? I took this clip of him casting, and then I made it so it's bait thingy. What's it called? The little sparkly feather thing? The fly? Yeah, the fly. The fly. Did you see how I made it turn into an angel? How I played with the word fly. You know, angels fly, fish bait flies. <laughs> you didn't know it was called a fly until just now. You know, um... Intuition. I sensed it. That happens to me a lot. I don't really know what I'm doing, but then it just comes together magically. As if a, like a second brain was doing all the work. Honestly, though, that imagery struck me as inherently problematic. Well, listen to you, Mr. Boss Man, with your big words. What I mean is, he's catching the angel with his fishing pole and then kind of fighting with it in the water. It isn't a peaceful image. It's disturbing, frankly. What do you mean? This is a good video. I'm really pushing myself as a memorial videographer. I'm on the bleeding edge. Language? <laughs> you need to use soothing language. We've been over this. <laughs> Clients have complained. Well, we really have a problem. They're just oversensitive. Most like that I'm a straight shooter. I'm a straight talker. They're sensitive because someone just died.